Okay, so welcome everybody. It is Monday the 20th of April um, and you are joining remote teaching for Ontario or Canada K-12, to particularly the elementary panel edition. Um, we want to thank everybody for taking the time to be here and we're looking forward to the conversation today. Um, my name is Bonnie Stewart. I'm at the University of Windsor and I'm one of our hosts for today. Um, Nick and Dave, do you want to introduce yourselves? Um, I'm Nick Baker. I'm the Director of Open Learning at the University of Windsor. Dave Cormier, I'm a Learning Specialist at the University of Windsor. And Fuada, you're also in Windsor. Why don't you? Uh... I am Fuada Hamsey and I am a teacher consultant with the Greater Essex County District School Board in Windsor, Ontario. But we're not just in Windsor. Peter? Uh, I'm in Thunder Bay, Ontario. I'm grade five, six teacher. Happy to be here. And Zoe. Hello, I'm from Hamilton, Ontario, uh, and I am a teacher for the Gifted and Enrichment Program, as well as an instructor at Brock University. And we are going to be talking about, as we are all now kind of working in online environments that no one had necessarily planned, um, here we are, how do we do this as well as we can? And we are gonna take about half an hour to talk with our panelists, hear some of the things that they're doing, some of the best practices um, that they're engaging in. And then we'll open this to questions from all of you. You're welcome to continue conversations in the chat throughout, but if you have questions for the panelists for the second half hour of the webinar, then please put them in the Q&A and we'll do the best we can to get to them. Basically, um, our framework for this whole session and for the intro session last week that didn't want to move, sorry, is um, C, simple, equitable, and engaging. And particularly under the circumstances where what we're doing is not necessarily a, a planned um, online learning type of exploration. Um, many of us here on screen today have worked in online learning for a long time. I'm, I'm the assistant professor of online learning and workplace learning at, uh, in the Faculty of Education at the University of Windsor. But the circumstances that all of us are in are not the same as, as that. So it's very much like hosting a dinner party uh, months from now versus oh my goodness, there's 20 people showing up on my doorstep and I've got to feed them. And some of you um, may be having a great time with this. Some of you may be experiencing some real stress about this. Some of you may be experiencing some real pushback, even from parents or students. I know Dave and Nick, you two are in the middle of um, the second week of a full week intensive online course for faculty at the university about the same shift. And are you finding that folks are experiencing stress with this? Yeah, I mean, the pushback, I, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't call it pushback. It's stress, it's um, anxiety. There's a lot of issues that people are dealing with that have nothing to do with the learning process, right? They're also locked in their houses. They're also um, dealing with their families. They're dealing with a lot of things that they weren't expecting to be dealing with when this started. Uh, but what we're finding, and this is something I encourage everybody in the belief of, what we're finding is that that changes really quickly. Once people are responded to with care and responded to with understanding, they start to process that feeling. And everybody kind of needs a place to put that frustration. And I'm imagining you're getting some of that from parents. Um, as a parent, when I turn around and I put on my parent hat, I felt that frustration myself with my kids and the stuff they were getting. Um, that's since been, like when you start to think about it, you're like, oh, this makes total sense. But at first I had a resistance. It had nothing to do with the content of what was coming. It had to do with my adapting to this situation. And we've seen that with the fac faculty that we trained last week at the beginning of the week. There's a lot of stress, there's a lot of tension. And by the end of the week, people are getting their cells behind it and they're really starting to come around. So it's one of those things where, you know, we're dealing with professionals. Eventually, that starts to come, right? And that, that tension and that stress is totally normal and understandable. But for classroom teachers, some of the folks that, that you're dealing with, they're, they're not professionals. And, you know, you've got families under any variety of circumstances right now trying to get online and navigate home learning for the first time. You've got students who are not project managers um, and maybe experiencing some overload with, with what you're putting out there. So our whole goal is really to, to talk about the things that we're doing to keep things simple, 
equitable and engaging for students during a time of home learning. My key message, this is something that I, I've had to do recently in my own teaching, is pare it down, keep paring it down. Um, to the point where sometimes I'm like, oh, I can't get any smaller than that. But this was my syllabus for my course, my digital technologies course last uh, year. And when I first moved to Windsor in the summer of 2018, I was accustomed to teaching in a Bachelor of Education program where students took five courses at a time. And I moved to a program where students took 10 courses at a time. And simply the cognitive load of managing that many things meant that even though officially my course was the same number of credit hours, I had to rethink the way that I assigned work, the way that I scheduled work, all of those things. I found that if I was doing more than two or three things in a given week, they just weren't getting done. And so I had to sit down and go, okay, if they can't process it, if they can't take it in, they're not going to learn it. And that was the key for us. Um, the last thing that I wanted to put out today, uh, Dave and I are Maritimers uh, who moved here, like I said, in 2018. And uh, so we were, like many of you, I'm sure, pretty, um, uh, it was pretty awful to hear the news coming out of Nova Scotia yesterday uh, with the mass shooting there. And uh, one of the one of the folks who was killed, the um, RCMP officer, her husband was a teacher, but also one of the folks who was killed uh, was actually a teacher herself, uh, Lisa McCulley, um, who was a grade three and four teacher at DeBert Elementary School in Nova Scotia. Um, I found out about supper time last night that this had happened because I went to college with Lisa. Lisa was a good friend of mine in my first year of university. And um, so I'm gutted and shocked and horrified by this news. But I wanted to share a photo that is not the one going around on CBC, but it is a photo that Lisa shared last week, um, a video that Lisa shared last week from her school where they had made a video uh, for their students. And I want you to see the joy in this person. And the thing, the most important thing about teaching ever is how you make people feel. And the thing that you remember about people is um, how they made you feel. And so when I went back and looked at all those photos from 30 years ago of the person I remember is Lisa Kirstead, the joy that you see right there is very much the person that I remember. And I want to encourage you to focus your online teaching towards how you make people feel. And with that, um, I'll introduce our panel. So, um, Zoe, I know you've all kind of said who you are, but we, we brought you in as folks who have been working um, in the online space in different ways for a few years. Um, Zoe, Fuada, and Peter, and all of you have specific experiences um, that you're working with in this time and place. So. I'm going to turn it over to Peter first um, as the person who's doing sort of the, the classroom um, leadership right now. And I'm going to move that as much so it's not too much in the way. And Peter, why don't you take it away? Sure. Thanks, Bonnie. And uh, hello to you all. I hope you're all keeping well and safe. And I just really, what I'm amazed by is, is how, in a way, that this is bringing us all together as educators. We're all working towards a common cause uh, with parents and with our students to, to make learning um, as accessible and as, as good as we can for our students. And we're all coming at this from, from, with different experiences. And um, I think it's just important really to break it down like Bonnie has. I like to do a one word project with my students at the beginning of the year and basically have them focus on one word. And it makes it just a little bit more manageable to have a goal and to achieve that goal. And I like Bonnie's three words and when she reached out to me, they actually really resonated with me as well. So I've just completed my second week of, of emergency distance learning. It's not what we chose to do, it's but what we have to do. And um, we're all in this together. We're, we're just doing our best. And so I think we have to be kind to ourselves as well. But in being kind, I think we have to keep it simple. So Bonnie's three words of simple, 
equitable and engaging are I think something that everybody can have kind of as, as, um, as their flag to, to think about. And so I just want to share a, just a few things, um, how kind of how I'm framing my, my classroom outside of the regular classroom. And the tweet is, I don't have to read it for you, but I've always really wanted to bring a sense of adventure to my students. When they come to class, I really want them to get up and get excited about coming to school. And I don't want them to have to do the assignment because they have to, but because they want to. And I think now more than ever, we can do that and we need to do that because um, everybody's struggling. So in making our assignments engaging, we're making it easier for all. So I'll share just a few ideas as to how I have made my first two assignments engaging. And at the same time, I think they're simple and equitable as well. So we can go to the next slide. So I've worked out a system and really uh, what I do is at the beginning of each day, I post a little video message to my students. Um, they're used to me greeting them first thing in the morning. So I, I create in Google Classroom a video message and I use Screencastify. The kids look forward to going on there. I usually have my dog with me. We can't bring our pets to school, but we can today. So they kind of look forward to, to um, meeting Summit and me and my, my daily greeting and to kind of just give them a little bit of feedback and some guidance. But then if we go back to that first slide, Bonnie, of, um, of it looked like a choice grid. So two back. Right, that one. So after my, my greeting, I have two assignments that the kids are working on every day. So it's simple because the parents know what their focus is and the kids know what to do. There's really only one tool. So they have a choice which also makes it equitable with a lot of different entry points for the kids as well. I have kids writing at all different levels, um, lots of identified students as well. But this is an entry point where the kids can go on, pick one topic to, to think about and write about, and then um, simply do this in their Google slide deck, or they can also do it on paper pencil and then they share it with me, but it's, it's continual. The following day, they go back and they do another writing prompt. And so for the first eight days, students did one, but they could also have done two or three, okay? And I encourage them simply just to dig deep. And that worked out really well. The other thing I had my students doing was a math learning journal where the kids went on, I had a total of I blog and I also have a website. So I had a total of 45 different real world math questions where they could go on and pick one of the 45 questions. They're bigger, deeper questions. So they have to really kind of dig into it, but they're engaged by it. And they, um, they shared their, their learning and their understanding either on paper pencil or using uh, their Google slide deck. And my job throughout that course of time every day was connecting with parents and students and giving them feedback and, and guiding and prompting them. So we're, we're now managing about 90 people, ensuring that we're all working collectively. And I have found that this is to be quite successful um, in having kids find that it's manageable and that it's, it's, it's working. Um, so this week, now we've completed their, their, their journals. This week I'm having them pick a book and basically go on an adventure through their books. And so their job is to read their book. They will also introduce their book in a flip grid. And then they have to pick one of these topics to kind of dig into and share about their book. And their job for math this week will be also to it's, I've changed that a little bit. They're watching a video. So we're digging back into place value. We're reinforcing that. And they're watching a short video within their Google slide. They're taking some notes on their learning and then they're using I know it math, which we've used before 
to demonstrate their learning and they get instant feedback through a mark. Well, they get the mark, which really isn't feedback, they get feedback from me. So it makes it, it, makes it a place, I found that it just kind of works where everybody knows exactly what they're going and what they have to do and they're engaged by it. I also found that Google Forms have been really, really, really good in a way for me to kind of just check in with my parents and my students. So this is something that I sent out to my, my students yesterday, still waiting for a few responses, but you can see that, you know, the question was, did they enjoy completing their stay at home journal? 100% of them said yes. Okay. Um, if you look, it, uh, we have the blue, all of them, 58% uh, completed the expected eight, but 42% of them, you know, completed even more. And this gives you an idea as well. They're actually, I, I would say more critical. Their work is actually really quite good. I'd say it's a lot of it is, is excellent work. Um, but 75% of them felt, you know, successful enough to say that they felt they had done well. 17% um, thought they'd done quite excellent. And then finally, you know, a very small percentage thought that they had done fairly. So again, I just want to say that I know that we're all coming at this together. Uh, I just read, wrote a blog post um, just to encourage you to continue to lean on one another, to support one another. And I know a lot of you are on Twitter as well. It, I, I'm, I'm inspired now more than ever to, to be an educator. And Peter, can you put the link to that blog post in the chat for us? Will do. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Fuada, we'll move on to you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, well, at first, I wanted to thank you all educators. You're doing a great job. And I know that uh, we have never been trained to do any of this. It just sprung on us and uh, we are doing our best. And I know that we are um, trying every day. We say that we need to do more and more and how can we do it even better? And we lean on each other and uh, that's what makes us even better educators. So thank you for all that you do. And I think these times are teaching us and uh, teaching the kids and families to be more empathetic and kind. And that's what uh, we need to do and we have to be kind to each other and to ourselves as well. So take care of yourselves, that's the most important thing. Um, and don't touch your face. And I keep touching my face. Um, I have to remind myself of that. So um, three things that, of course, I took from uh, Bonnie's presentation and Dave and Nick's presentation on Thursday, and I keep reminding myself uh, to keep everything simple, of course, equitable and engaging. And engaging is what I'm going to focus on, and as well as simple and equitable. But I keep uh, wanting to go back to engaging. So this is a video. Um, that you could show kids something very simple. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. You can find it online. Uh, Bonnie, if you could just show maybe like 45 seconds of this video, if you don't mind. It shows um, objects. We can go back and play uh, the first 45 seconds of the video. It shows objects that are uh, zoomed in. It, it yeah. It won't play because it's just in the slide. So oh, is, yeah, oh. sorry. Um, when I okay. when I click the screen, it just goes to the next slide. Okay, um, that's okay. That's okay. That's fine. The next slide actually shows a great example of it. So, so yeah, I'll just talk about it then. So this is just a stem of an apple. It shows it zoomed in, and when it zooms out, it shows the whole apple. And it goes through different objects that are um, everyday things that kids see. So it goes through a pencil, a sharpener, and it's just a mind's on activity, something very simple that you can find online and it doesn't have to be this specific video. But the whole reason is that it's something that could be engaging to the kids, uh, could be relevant to the kids, um, and it just allows us to come up with questions that we can ask. And if we can go to the next slide, thank you. So what do you think this picture is? Something like this that we can pose to the kids, again, in uh, asynchronous setting or synchronous setting, whatever you choose to do. Um, a question that we pose, something like this. And then we ask them, what were the clues to this guess? So it could be this picture, it could be something else. 
And something like this, again, very simple, could be engaging. What uh, is their thinking? What we wanted to do is elicit uh, interactions, whether the kids are sending you the answers. I, my daughter is in grade eight and she sends answers to her uh, teachers and it doesn't have to be in synchronous setting. And then the teacher responds back by asking, so what made you think this way? And that kind of connects the teacher with the students all the time. And I like that because um, my, my daughter says she feels connected to her class, even though they're not connecting all the time. And that shows the kindness that is present. So if we can go to the next slide, if you don't mind. Thank you. Very simple, again, that we saw the image before. Those were soap bubbles, by the way, if you were wondering what they were. And it was a zoomed in image on soap bubbles. And as you could see, it is relevant to the situation that we are in. We are asking questions of kids that we want them to relate to why is soap important. So questions that are simple, questions that are relevant, but they are accessible. As you could see here, I've asked questions that are for different um, divisions. These questions do not have to be asked for a specific grade level. They can be posed so that they are asked for a, a division-wide question. So any kid from that division could be um, answering the question. They could be posed to the whole household. Um, if you have kids that range from grade one to grade eight, they could uh, attempt any of those questions. The parents do not feel overwhelmed by answering the grade eight question if they have students that may not be at the grade eight level. Um, again, it is cross-divisional, it's chunking. They don't have to be all answered at once. It could be from the beginning of the week till the end of the week, as Peter said could be two things that you do the whole week. It doesn't have to be, it is due tomorrow. Um, and it, they are very equitable. The kids are self-differentiating. So if I feel that I cannot do the grade eight question or the grade seven question, I may only be able to do the grade three or four question and that's okay. And that's what we need to do is that something that is uh, engaging to the kids something that is relative, relative to them and something that is accessible. So they really don't need to go online for hours and hours to look for answers for something like this. And it's also um, not so daunting for the parents. I know that the parents are having a hard time answering so many questions. I've actually asked my hairdresser the other day how she was doing just to check in with her. And she said to me, you know, I've only had a certain level of math and now I have to do more math with my kids that I've never done before. And it is really hard for me. I'm seeking help from everyone. And we have to remember that it's on us too, as parents, uh, we are privileged as teachers that we have, we can help our kids, but other parents are not able to help their kids. So we have to keep it simple as much as possible and engaging as much as possible as well so that the kids could remember that. You know, I remember the soap bubbles when they were enlarged and I will remember, um, you know, why if I was to uh, use this type of soap or this type of soap, it gave me more um, suds or, um, you know, more lather. Maybe they can do an experiment at home because they have accessible, they have the accessibility of different type of soaps at home. So something that they don't have to go out and buy. We have to remember that, that there, these are not times where they can go and buy different things. Um, really so just to keep, keep it simple. And with that simplicity, I love that you brought out the idea of, of differentiation, right? And self-differentiation so that students Absolutely. can find something that's accessible to them in an assignment. And that those of us who have, you know, our family, we have the privilege of education, but right now both of us are working um, putting an awful lot of things online and don't necessarily have the privilege of time to spend with our kids. So there are grade six and grade eight, any teacher that gives us assignments that my kids can do together, I love, I love very much. So I'm gonna turn it over to you for five minutes. Be my guest. Oh, you're muted. Hi, everybody. I uh, see lots of familiar faces in the chat. It's uh, nice to have everyone here on um, 
such a great day. Uh, sunny here in Hamilton. Um, I uh, I wanted to just start with this just quick video. I don't want to play the video, but I'm just, my, my presentation really is just taking some of the information that I have learned over the last two weeks, but also things that I have done over the last 10 years online, working not just with students, but also um, in an online community like we are all in now. And I saw this video by Chris Hatfield recently. I don't know if anyone else has seen it, but as soon as I did see it, I put it out to my own students just to get them thinking about what I isolation it means and he talks a little bit about life and self-isolation as, re as related to um, the life of an astronaut and um, you know we wake up we spend our day working doing whatever and we go to bed all within the same confinement just like an astronaut and um, he talks about how this is not normal and that we need to shift our perception we have a, um, we have a crew we have a spaceship and we have a common enemy right now he says but we need to adjust our lives and we we need to emerge out of this in a victorious way. And I think it just it was a really powerful statement. And he gives some advice to not just us as educators and, and learners and students, but he um, many of the things that he said relates to what we're doing in the classroom. So uh, reminding students about breaking the day into chunks, um, not sitting in our screen for such long periods of time. Um, but um, he said that, that even in space, they need to break their day into chunks chunks and I think it helps them get a good relation um, as to um just making that connection. Uh, we can, um, the other thing I wanted to, I just wanted to share is, uh, I don't, I guess you could see, I did a screenshot from a post that I, uh, that I wrote in 2011, and it was called, Who is Your Doug Peterson? And so from the, the rest of the slides here that I wanted to share were really slides that talk about, um, you know, our connections with others and as classroom teachers, and I'm specifically an elementary school teacher. I teach, also teach the junior ABQ course at Brock but the impact that we have when we're learning online and um, about 10 years ago I started doing this uh, these kinds of connections and I'm going to be honest it was really difficult afterwards um, or when I went go back into the reg into the you know bricks and mortar type of learning because this part of my learning environment was so much more authentic and I think this is something that we're all going to take in a positive way back to the classroom but I think as a professional we are going to emerge from this in in a way where we all are in building such a strong community um, something will be lost though because we cannot do what we were doing and what we are doing right now at the same time so giving things up is, is going to be valuable and important um, I, I I think we need to, someone else mentioned uh, empathy um, and kindness. And I think that uh, it's interesting when I look at this, I, I'm gonna share with you, all of you on your screens, just some people who have impacted me over the last two weeks. It doesn't mean that over the last nine years, um, you all that are in this room haven't, uh, but in particular, people who are just very, in, um, throwing some of their ideas, sharing. Um, in fact, Peter um, is one that him and I have been trying to communicate a lot over the last two weeks as well. Um, but this one, uh, if you, I'm just going to let you guys all read it, but that Max Fawcett, I just absolutely loved it, that that urge to say I love you at the end of the call, and we're all feeling that. Tim, um, as you, I wrote, uh, I did a little screenshot, if you haven't had a chance to, or you don't follow Tim King, I think you should, uh, but he gave a really good image of how we're feeling right now in terms of what we are thinking we want to do with the horse, and then what we're actually doing, and then again, that brings back to those three words. Bonnie has, and uh, Peter were mentioning earlier with keeping things simple and equitable. Um, you can move. Okay, thank you. Um, every day in the last, since we've been in this isolation and we haven't been in school, I've been finding, trying to find some time to just go through my educated, educator Twitter feed, which I value. And I try to, and, and as a teacher, because I'm still teaching online, just like many of you, um, I'm also, te uh, whether or not it's with young children and with adults, and I try to find the resources that are the most current. And the, uh, so 
the ones you see right here, if you haven't um, followed Jim, uh, he, is a, uh, he provides a lot of history resources. Again, these are teacher curated resources, but take a look if you haven't had a chance because he'll put something up uh, daily. We, the, I also looked a little bit about uh, these um, educational TED Talks. We Are Teachers is, um, I followed them a lot and I hope that if you don't get a chance, uh, if you get a chance on Twitter to take a look at their feed, it's, uh, it's valuable, but they, um, but, but I do caution. And so um, I had a, an email from a parent this morning uh, a, from a student who was very upset about some videos they were watching and they uh, were having nightmares. And so I think that what we need to do is just make sure that um, we are providing an, al uh, an alternative method. Video can be very graphic, especially when it comes to history. Um, the other, these two individuals that you see here, Andrea comes from my district school board at HWDSB, but I, I was particularly struck by this one and I think that maybe now is the time we are um, not, not just having to always go into a deep open-ended kind of question sometimes it's about building skills like typing like uh, handwriting um, you know printing getting kids uh, to practice these and it's easier on parents and it helps them Julie Dweck absolutely follow um, gives lots of information um, uh, it, lots of um, maker space uh, at home activities but still tries to look at it from an equitable point of view and this was a something I I had never seen that particular uh, link you had had just looked at with the um, coding of an arcade that was a new resource to me if you haven't I'm sure many of you have but if you haven't had a chance to look at the digital human library I really hope you do because even um, even though you're being bombarded with so much I have tr th this kind of um, site has already been curated so all the virtual experiences free as well um, and parents will really appreciate it Jennifer King is also someone I would suggest she keeps um, because she keeps um, posting all of her resources similar to the way Peter is, but um, but is also resharing a lot of what other people are doing. And the choice boards are amazing. I love them. Uh, I use them a lot in my own classroom, but I do feel a little bit apprehensive, uh, especially because my focus is teaching gifted. Um, it, choices can sometimes be very difficult. So I have received some phone calls last week just from parents um, wanting me to give them choice A or choice B versus a whole bunch of choices so that they can uh, choose better. Um, also, uh, I think it's important to look at what's available online with reading. I put two resources up here, um, right here. Uh, I've had my students do this last week. We just use a blog. We don't use any, uh, because I'm a system teacher at the moment, I'm not using a, a Google Classroom. I don't want to give the students or teachers any more than they need, but I am just pr trying to provide as many resources as possible, and that's that one. Um, the other one was a book club. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to go take a look, um, amazing educators, also Ontario, that are um, trying to look a little bit at, look look at um, what we're our PD and what we're reading. Um, I've added a few other ones here. If you don't, um, Alice Keeler does some amazing work with Google Slides. Unfortunately, my district is moving away from Google next year, but um, but it, it it also reminds us that you know we are adaptable and the skills we're using even right now with certain tools, we are going to be able to move to those skills into other tools. It's all the same. I put a little quote up there. Um, I, ha I, I had to talk a little bit about the offline, um, but also uh, the offline activities we can be doing with our kids uh, in elementary grades. Uh, I do a lot of games with my students in the classroom. This particular game, Dixit, is one that I found this year that I absolutely love. I don't know if any of you have tried it, but if you, I did write a blog post recently to sh um, with some additional links on how to use it at home. But I think what the real message I'm trying to say is, is how Help parents see uh, what some of these skills are, what learning looks like back, um, what learning actually looks like versus it doesn't have to just be a product. We can be embracing the process and the process is often happening all the time, but people aren't as aware as we are as educators um, back in the household. So just to remind parents when they're doing those games how beneficial it is. 
I only have uh, a couple more. Uh, Jamie is someone I think uh, is a math teacher actually in secondary, but I would um, I would recommend taking a look because um, there's a lot of um, he's he's participating again in real world data collection and being um, and a lot of that is being shared uh, glo glo shared across our country. So just have a have a look and see what he does. But he's also been sharing some of the work. And Donna um, here, another one that I've shared is. Um, ha really promoting some of the live events. So there's all sorts of, which gives choice, all sorts of events um, going on um, from scheduled. Now here it is not in Eastern Standard Time, but uh, we can convert that if you are posting anything out into your classroom. To end off, I, I think that with all of this and, and I'm doing what everyone else is doing and just throwing information at you or throwing uh, tools and links and so on, but we have to recognize that we, we are, none of what we're doing is duplicating what we're doing in the classroom. And I think what I saw here, what uh, Jerry wrote um, really resonated. I, I screenshotted right away. Um, we do need to still follow our expectations as teachers, stay professional online, uh, be cautious of what we're just saying and doing online, even if we're not agreeing with everything. And, be, and, and again, there's that word, kind to ourselves, to our parents, to our students. So um, be careful that, um, to recognize that we're all in different entry points here. So uh, that's it. Uh, I had, there was one more. Um, I was, um, I am representing ETFO in uh, providing um, some information just very briefly to the ministry. And so if anybody here uh, would like to share their voice or their thoughts as to these two questions, I did put the link um, on here. I don't know if it's in the, in the chat or not, but uh, if, you can, if you wanna take a moment, that would be great. I can add your voice to the discussion. Great. And maybe if someone can copy that into the chat, um, we'll, or we'll make sure it gets there after. Um, I'm cognizant of time and I want to move to questions. So I just wanted to say thank you for being part of this and for listening. And now I'd like to turn it over to you. And I'm also thinking that I'm going to start a 3 p.m. 3.15 p.m. EDT Tuesdays kind of drop in if educators, whether at the faculty level um, K to 12 level, pre-service level, want to talk about what you're doing in terms of online pedagogy. Um, happy to kind of take up space. I'll send the links out on the Online Learning in a Hurry K-12 edition website, um, which is right there at alaya.ca. And hopefully I'll see some of you there, but let's turn this right over to questions. I think Dave and Nick are going to manage those for our panelists. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you for uh, all the questions. For those of you who are asking questions and hoping to get a response right away, I do apologize. We are going to try to get to those questions as we go along. Um, I've been, uh, I, I, Peter's been answering some of the questions as we go, but I'd like to pull some of those back and sort of bring them out to people. Um, one of the, the sort of big issues that we've been talking about here is sort of making it so that teachers feel good about what they're doing. And one of the questions that came up was, how do you navigate the fears of staff who have no, had no online presence or been blended learning with devices in their classroom? So what do you do? How do we talk to the people who are totally terrified, the people who wouldn't come out to a session like this because they don't think they belong? Uh, they would, you'd be more than welcome, but who wouldn't feel comfortable in these kinds of spaces? Uh, Fada, why don't you try to uh, take that one first? Uh, unmute. Thank you. Um, and we have a few, of course, of teachers that have not had any online presence. Um, to come from us, I think it is difficult. It has to come within their own community and within the school. Um, and that's what I try to do is um, I try to set them up with teachers within their school that they're more comfortable with in my role as a consultant um, and that they had uh, a, a teacher within their department that coached them. And uh, it was a very close um, relationship and they set up, um, showed them how to set up um, uh, online uh, and how to connect with their classroom. Um, and they started from there. It is baby steps. And we have to remember um, that they're not comfortable and we don't wanna push those boundaries. And we have to 
uh, take care of them as well. And we have to be kind. Right. Peter, how about you? What do you do whenever you're trying to bring somebody on board? Yeah, as an educator, um, I think it's just important to keep yourself open to to your peers, particularly where many of us are on Twitter and we have extensive PLNs and I can take risks and do something different because I can, I know I can send out a tweet and I'll have answers almost immediately. Or, you know, I have people who have worked on a doc with me, but that's not necessarily the case. So I think it's really important for people who are comfortable um, within the online environment to reach out to their colleagues in their own school boards. Let's not forget that. Let's, let's also um, make, make a difference for each other locally as well. So I really encourage everybody, and I, I've said this before on Twitter as well, is, is reach out to someone who you aren't necessarily connected with um, online and just make sure they're doing all right. And we're all happy to help. I think uh, I've really recognized and, and noticed that. So uh, reach out ask other people for help. And also, I, I really hope that those people would be comfortable enough with their friends to ask for help too. You have to ask though. Right. Um, Zoe, do you want to grab that one too? Oh, well. Uh, just, you know, I think that we need to remember teachers or students too, that we need to ask for accommodations and modifications and support with each other. We also have to realize that uh, you know, not everybody has to be full blown into this, right? If, if that, so there's going to be really, really amazing teachers, some of us out there that are, are fabulous in the classroom, but this is not an area of comfort. And I think that, um, that therefore their team needs to take one on for the, for their team and, uh, you know, and draw on people's strengths and weaknesses and that that's okay. So letting them know, no, you don't have to do it. Maybe we can um, do it for you, or maybe we can do it with you, not necessarily for you, but it's okay that not everybody is actively on like we are right now. So uh, there are a lot of questions about specific technology help. And actually, it almost sounds like in some cases asking permission for technology. I do heartily encourage you to understand that each one of your districts and each one of your principals and each one of your situations is going to have different guidelines and rules around what you can do. So I don't want to give you a piece of technical advice that tells you you can go ahead and do something if it's specifically not what you're supposed to be doing inside your system. So before you enter into a variety of tools, it's good to reach out to the people who are inside of your organization to find out if that's something that they're supporting, right? So you don't want to and actually, this goes to what Nick says, and let me ask him to, to elaborate on this. Nick, in terms of talking about the one tool and state communicating directly with parents, can you elaborate on that comment you made in the chat room, please? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it's one, of the, it's one of the things that you're going to face because there are so many different companies coming at you with all sorts of offers and the school boards are doing the same thing. They're trying to collect a whole lot of resources and say, here, these are all available to you. But... Um, trying to minimize the number of those that you use and communicate in a really simple way. You know, think about your, your most basic um, need from, from a learner's point of view is that simple communication from you um, and something that parents can see as well as, is also really useful um, using, there are usually a couple of tools that each board has that are available to you for communication, but I'd say pick one of those and just stick with it rather than bouncing around backwards and forwards between multiple tools. Um, and then the other thing I would say, just as a tip, if you are choosing to use different systems, different tools, you want your students jumping into, you know, Knowledge Hook today and Pebble Go tomorrow and all of those kinds of things, try and keep a, a document or a place where all of the generic passwords that you've got and the URLs to, to get to those things is really simply visibly available to your students mm -hmm. because trying to find them in Edsby or going back through Brightspace or wherever the, wherever you've communicated that can be really challenging. Okay. Thanks, Nick. I appreciate that. Um, one of the other issues that um, people are talking about is the distinction between when to go synchronous and when to go asynchronous. I think I'm going to flip this one to Bonnie. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, how P 
people can make that distinction between those two things? The, the idea of synchronous is just pulling people together in real time and, and expecting that there be some kind of um, real time meeting of the classroom. Uh, whereas the asynchronous is people things that you give directions usually in some form of writing and or a video that people can watch on their own time and then usually use discussion board or whatever the platforms that your board has made available to you um, to connect. Synchronous, I, I, like I'm spending a lot of my life in Zoom meetings right now. I am, um, again, not a fan of Zoom, not supporting Zoom for teaching by any stretch. And I would minimize synchronous as much as possible, partly because a lot of kids extracurricular activities have now gone on, on to synchronous online as well. So my kids are doing theater and karate on Zoom. And it is, that's, that's great. My kids are able to do that, but not all kids in their classroom are able to do it. Um, folks have three kids in a home. The teachers set the same Zoom times. It's just not viable for families. So one, if you are going to do synchronous, particularly with younger kids, I can see some value in, in the connection of that, but make it rare, make it optional, and do not make it zero sum in the sense that families feel stressed or penalized like they absolutely must be there. Um, I think it can be great if you're saying, hey, you might like to connect, um, please join me, I'll be here. Some kids are, are really valuing seeing um, and connecting with their teacher in real time, but the more that you can set up in super simple ways, for asynchronous, do this on your own time. Check in when you get up on Monday, look at what you're gonna do for the week. Please have these three things do Friday, no more. Do not give them more. You can dial it down. Do not give them busy work. It is really hard for a lot of families to manage right now. Nobody is expecting to parent full-time while managing their kids' home learning, and the, the project management just isn't there. Um, yeah, Nabucco, someone, somebody has a question there. Um, what would you suggest? I've been doing PDFs and don't want to overwhelm. Dave, I think you're muted. No, I'm letting you in. You said you were going to, I was waiting for you to finish your sentence. Um, so bridging onto that, where you say, you know, only three things. One of the questions that came along earlier was, what advice do you have to do that reframing? So if a teacher looks at their curriculum and they look at their 12 subjects and they've got all this stuff that's piled up and there's all these things they're supposed to do, Bringing that down to three things is not a, not a simple, casual process. What advice, and we're gonna go around the round table again, or maybe this time I'll start with Zoe. Uh, what advice do you have for people looking at the swath of the things that they were supposed to do in a face-to-face -face classroom, and how would they pare that down to manageable space? What kind of things should they be thinking about? Um, yeah, we have lots of expectations, and I think that rec uh, constantly uh, you know, timing ourselves, uh, giving or chunking it, like we, I, I mentioned at the very beginning, chunking our days. Uh, I have to think we need to be very cognizant of our, of our uh, work day. Uh, are we working from eight to four? Are we working from seven to three? Um, are we spending time with our family like we should be? Are we taking care of ourselves, our well-being? Uh, because there are the expectations that we had back in the brick and mortar uh, teaching environment has to look different in our expectations now. And I think that both the ministry in Ontario and other ministries, as well as our districts are giving guidelines about how much work uh, from a perspective as a system teacher, what I am seeing is that students in elementary and junior um, and intermediate classrooms, uh, many are in, in rotary style learning environments, which means that the rotary uh, teachers are sometimes, all of them are doing a Google Classroom, all of them with subject-based content. And so those kids, so to the teacher, they're only getting this much work, but to the student, they're getting this much work from um, science, this much work from history, this much. So this is a conversation I had with a kid the other day who had said they had seven Google Classrooms, all wow. with about two to three different uh, sort of kind of uh, projects on the go. And so I think right now, back in the schools, we need to be talking to our principals and our, you know, and our learning communities within the schools and reminding people that know that we can't be putting that much up on, work onto our kids nor onto ourselves. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I know in, in our case, we one of the really things that I really liked about one of the teachers that my kid has um, is they asked my child how they were feeling about their workload, asked them about how they were doing with a given activity, 
asked them to like, after one of the first assignments, he sent a message to my kid and said, how did you feel about that assignment? Was it easier for you to understand? Were you able to work your way through it? Did you understand my feedback? And I think that's some of the piece too. Like I think all the professional communication parts are important, but also just talking to the kids. Partially it's a great outreach, it's pedagogies of care, it's wonderful, but it's also a great way of gauging how much effort this really is for the, for the students as well. It's gotta be part of the picture. Peter, thoughts? Absolutely. How do we pare it down? You, you have to. <laughs> and I think you really have to just cut all the fat and get to the meat. Um, so look at your overall expectations. Um, and, you know, you can chunk as well. So, you know, if you think about reading, I'm, I'm covering, I know, just with that, that reading journal that I'm doing, I'm not only am I differentiating to my students because it's very open-ended, but I'm also having them focus on all of the reading strategies that we've covered this year and, and also their, their writing, right? So um, don't be afraid. It doesn't have to be expectation by expectation. Turn to your textbook, photocopy it and send it out. It doesn't have to be like that. That's painful for kids. It really is. It's painful for parents. So I'm speaking from experience. Um, it doesn't have to be like that. Y you have the freedom to be creative here. We also don't have the EQAO test that I'm very happy about that teachers normally are teaching to right now. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's really, let's really um, get a sense and a focus as to what will the kids really want to be doing? Will they want to do that or will they have to? And, and the point you make Dave as well is about reaching out. That's really important. Google forums is my favorite thing, favorite way to do that. You can very quickly get a sense as to where your students are at. Um, we know when we're standing in front of those 30 yeah. kids, you That's can right. read their body language. You can read, you know, you can tell when they're struggling. We, we need to connect and, and find out both with our parents and with our students. Wada, what's your perspective? How do we pare things down? Oh, you're on mute. Oh, I get you on mute. There we go. Um, I say, look at the big ideas. What yeah. are the big ideas? And yeah. that's what you do. Um, big ideas, overall expectations, that's what we need to do. We don't need to look at every single little expectations. Uh, nobody's saying we need to uh, cover every single one uh, for us to finish the year. Uh, please, the big ideas is what we need. And that's all I'm stressing. That's all what I'm doing with my kid at home too. I'm not stressing it, her out, and I'm stre I'm not stressing myself out either, as an educator, as a parent. That's great. That's great. I think that's a message that everybody needs because there's a wonderful opportunity here, right, to focus on not filling time, and because normally folks are obliged to fill that time between nine and three, you're not. Take that off your shoulders. Focus on what are the main things that you want kids to learn. How can you take an idea and communicate it in a simple way that they can do in a variety of households, in a variety of ways, and be creative with that. Take the rest of it off your shoulders for now. And We'd think about the hours, yes. And kids behind. Yeah, and think sure. about the hours, right? How many hours does the ministry say we have to do? Not many. Don't do, how many? Yes, and don't do too much. Don't do over those hours. Yeah. Don't. Is it five for K to eight or three for younger grade? Well, four. Five. Uh, it's it's what is it? Uh, ten for. Um, it's it's five for. Uh, um, sorry, intermediate. Mm -hmm. It's five. Help me out. Somebody help me out here. Five for intermediate. I think the younger ones are just three. So I mean, literally, it takes. If you're sending people a whole bunch of different platforms or a whole yeah, bunch they're telling me it's it's five for K to six and ten for intermediate. Yeah, for seven to eight. And that's yeah, they're helping me out. The my 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 friends are helping me out. <laughs> five five for K to six and ten for intermediate. So, so that's don't... two hours per uh, let's say math and and literacy, right? Yep. And then you have social studies and science that alternate. So keep it pared down. 
Yeah, pare it down. Spend enough time. Like absolutely. And let and let teachers know in a kind way. Yeah, if your if your child is doing is doing too much, that's something Peter mentioned. And but also figure out ways to check in with families and just make sure they're doing okay. Yeah. So and as we, Peter said, sorry, as mm -hmm. Peter said, if they can't get to it this week, that's okay. So we've got uh, two minutes left here. Um, Bonnie, do you want to wrap us up or do we want to do one more round? How would you like to handle it? I'm seeing, I'm seeing so many good questions here. What I am going to encourage, I think what we're going to try to do is capture some of these questions and then um, maybe take them to future Tuesday 315 drop-ins um, with me and I'll invite folks to join me who are situated to answer the questions. Um, but the big thing I think I'd like to say, since we are really close to time and we don't want to go over, communicate. Um, communicate with families, communicate with students, but that communication doesn't need to be a huge push of information. Not everyone is going to be able to keep up with what you're doing. Imagine that you were teaching in your classroom and a whole bunch of your students are sitting out in the hallway and consider how you frame and how you reach out to the hallway to bring those students into the extent that you can. Because again, what matters is what they take away from how they felt during this time. This time is going to shape how a lot of kids understand and see learning in new ways. And there's an opportunity to do something powerful. You don't have to do the world and all. You don't need to be hugely technically savvy. Just figure out effective, simple, equitable ways to communicate with students and families. And yes, let's, let's keep doing this. Probably I will um, put something out on the K-12 OLIA, k12.oliah ca that's online learning in a hurry dot ca um, about a sort of drop in that all of us educators can join and talk and um, on Tuesdays in future so I'll put that in there and I think we We're will at the top of the hour wrap it up I want to say huge thank you um, to Zoe Peter and Fuada for joining us and for sharing what you're doing um, to Nick and Dave for hosting us through the Office of Open Learning um, and to everybody who joined us. Thank you very much. And this recording will be available on the website that's here in the chat. And um, you are welcome to share it around with your boards, your friends, whoever you think might want to see it. Take care. Cheers, everybody.